This is an interview for the Purdue University's Oral History Program. Today's date is October 14th, 2015. The interviewer is Tracy Grimm, Baron Hilton Archivist for Flight and Space Exploration at Purdue University Archives and Special Collections. Today I'm interviewing Dr. Philip Tompkins. Dr. Tompkins is Emeritus Professor of Communication and Comparative Literature, University of Colorado at Boulder. He received his PhD in organizational communication from Purdue University in 1962. Welcome, Dr. Tompkins. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin by asking you about your early years <coughs> and your education. Yes. Where were you born? Where did you grow up and what was it like? I was born in uh, Erie, Kansas in, uh, on October 8, 1933. I was born at home, and you've heard of the birth trauma, haven't you? The birth trauma. Birth trauma, the, you know, the, 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 this crash of coming into the world mm -hmm. and what it must do to our psyche and so on. Well, when I was born, at the exact moment I was born at home, uh, mm -hmm. the, at the exact moment I was born, the bed broke, <sighs> and my mother and I crashed uh, to the floor. Oh so I had more than the usual <laughs> birth trauma, and in addition to that, uh, we had the beginning of the Dust Bowl in Kansas, oh, right. and um, the uh, beginning of the Depression as well, and uh, things were tough uh, indeed. My father was a music teacher who moved uh, soon after that to Emporia, Kansas and taught music at Emporia College and the college went broke mm. and the world famous uh, journalist William Allen White, publisher of the Emporia Gazette came over to the house to say the college could no longer afford to pay my father's salary but um, he had set up an account for us at a local grocery store where at least we could eat. Wow. Um, that was William Allen White of the Emporia Gazette. The next important story in my life comes in 1936, the presidential election. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was running for re-election and my mother was beside herself with the Dust Bowl, with employment difficulties and raising uh, at that time three children. So she heard that the president was coming to campaign in Emporia and was going to stop at the railroad station. And she had described it to me so many times that it is etched forever in my memory and it can be found in the history books that his sons helped him out onto the caboose to speak to the large crowd gathered there. And uh, he said, William Allen White, please come up here and shake hands with the President of the United States. Um, William Allen White was a, the publisher, editor of the Emporia Gazette, which was the most important progressive Republican newspaper in the country at that time. Nothing happened. My mother is holding me, and I'm three years old, uh, watching all of this, and it's as if I can see it. The president talk briefly and then finally he said Bill White come up here and shake hands with me you know we're good friends except every four years when the election rolls around <laughs> so Bill White came up out of the audience and shook hands with the president and my mother became a Democrat on that occasion <laughs> because of the depression the dust bowl and here was a president who came to see us and therefore I became a Democrat as well. Mm -hmm. I went on, we moved on to Wichita, Kansas. I went through the public schools there. Uh, I went uh, in college. I went to Wichita High School North and uh, I was on the um, debate 
team and the wrestling team, an unusual combination. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had scholarships at the University of Northern Colorado, where I got my undergraduate degree and uh, wrestled and debated. And if you would like a funny story, uh, I can say that uh, we weighed in for a match. We had our weight classifications, we had to make weight, and we had starved uh, down to the weight. So we, after weighing in, we ate honey and water, drank water and so on. And the coach looked at me and called me Tommy. He said, Tommy, if you can't roll him over onto his back, talk him into it. <laughs> because he was proud that I was also on the debate team. I thought I would, I thought I would go to um, law school, but I took time out to get a master's degree in speech, as the term was back in those days, at the University of Nebraska and they gave me an assistantship and I helped coach debate and I wrote a uh, master's thesis on George Norris's campaign to uh, produce the unicameral legislature in Nebraska. Nebraska is the only state in the union with a one house legislature and it was um, one man did it. George W. Norris, U.S. Senator from Nebraska, was uh, his ethos, credibility, was so high with uh, Nebraskans that he persuaded them to do it, to make it, it is uh, nonpartisan, you're not elected by a uh, Democrat or Republican Party, and it has one house. Um, this is the same uh, George Norris who was one of the five people featured in John F. Kennedy's Profiles in Courage. Profiles in Courage. Yes. yes. Um, I took time out, still thinking I was going to go to law school, but I took time out to go to the university, to take a job at the University of Kansas, my home state, Lawrence, Kansas, Mount Orient. And I was an instructor and assistant debate coach and the experience was so wonderful that I thought, how could I ever find better customers than university students? Mm -hmm. This is what I want to do. And there was a young department chair there who said, there is a man at Purdue University, and his name is W. Charles Redding, and he is trying to develop a program in which you study complex organizations as communication systems. This sounded very interesting to me, so I corresponded with uh, Dr. Redding, and um, I came to Purdue uh, with a Ross Aid Fellow Fellowship. Do they still have still have those? Oh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, came to Purdue and um, took me three years to complete that and to learn the theory and research as it existed at mm -hmm. that time. And I was in the first generation of students. Uh, Alan H. Monroe was the head of the, was then speech department, I think. He hired me uh, in uh, 1962, and I stayed for three years as an assistant professor. And then I moved on as an associate professor. I went through a divorce in 1965 and moved on to Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. Three things happened there that might be of interest to the archives and uh, to the uh, library here. Uh, number one, on a trip back to Purdue, I visited uh, Bruce Kendall, H. Bruce Kendall, who had been uh, my thesis advisor at, master's thesis advisor at the University of Nebraska, and had moved here as a, as a professor in charge of their basic course and so on. And I came to visit him 
and he stuck a book in my hand, gave me a drink, put on classical music, and I read the book from cover to cover. The title of the book was In Cold Blood by Truman Capote. Oh. And it was about the murder of four members of the Clutter family in Holdridge, Color Holdridge, Kansas. Mm -hmm. Capote claimed to have created a new literary genre the non-fiction novel. Every word is true, but using his gift as a novelist, he could write a non-fiction novel. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if this is true, if this is a new genre, then we need a new genre of criticism. Because literary critics do not worry about the facts of fiction, do they? They might worry about credibility, but I read the book and had some suspicions, and as I'm going to point out tomorrow in my lecture, I replicated Capote's methods. I went to Garden City, Kansas, to Holdridge, Kansas, interviewed everyone there, read all the newspaper files, got the um, confession of Perry Smith, one of the two killers, and got the transcript of the trial of the two killers in Topeka, Kansas, wrote an article that appeared in Esquire magazine in June of 1966, the title of which was In Cold Fact. <laughs> Clever. In Cold Fact. Esquire said, we're not interested in this unless you can also explain why Capote made the changes. And I said, I can do that beautifully because I was taught rhetorical theory and rhetorical criticism as a graduate student at Nebraska and, and Purdue, and I'll do that. And I did it in the article. It has been reprinted several times in literary anthologies, and I have es essentially won the battle with the Capote over it. The reason why he did it was that the Perry Smith, one of the two killers, was a semi-literate, cold-blooded fiend. And Capote took a liking to him, projected his own personality into Perry Smith, and made him a, a Le poet maudit, as the French say, the, the crazed poet. I didn't know what I was doing, but when I found the confession, his confession taken down by a certified court stenographer, he said, we was debating who would go first. They had the, all four of the victims tied up. Mm. And he said, I pretended I was going to tighten his ropes, and that's when I cut Mr. Clutter's throat. Mm -hmm. In Cold Blood does not refer to the killing of the clutters. He wants you to believe that that was a spontaneous schizophrenic eclipse. It refers to the execution of Perry and Dick. Cold blooded, the courts and the people voted to hang them by their necks and so on. So he changed the, the facts uh, basically uh, to, to, uh, to do that. So yeah. that was after you had gone to your summer faculty positions at, at uh, NASA, or was that before? Uh, that is, this is uh, 1966 so. it occurs, and 1966 I also mm -hmm. get a phone call from uh, Walter Wiesman, the youngest of the Germans, to come over in the, um, in the, um, Yes, Project Paperclip. Yeah. Yes, yes indeed. Ah, you have read the book. Good for you. Then I don't need to spend a whole lot of time. Uh, Von Braun was absolutely brilliant. The uh, second smartest person I have ever met in my life. Absol Technically smart? What, um, how would you describe In all ways. Uh, he, uh, at the age of 22, he had 
two engineering degrees and a PhD in physics. He uh, could uh, play the piano and the cello and had composed music for those instruments. He had a pilot's license uh, and became a jet pi an experimental pilot, pilot of experimental plane. Spoke three languages. All of this by the age of uh, age of 22, and um, decided his mother was a genius also, who had um, uh, had uh, memorized the four volumes of the great German masterpiece. I blocked on it sometimes. Uh, got me there. Perhaps we'll think of it later. Okay. She had memorized uh, all of it and recited it at his death. And he had uh, memorized part of it too and had, um, because he could quote the passages about traveling through the heavens. Because his ambition always was to explore space. He had to go to work for Hitler. He developed the V-2, but they um, had a discussion with his top people. They decided, we've had enough of totalitarianism. Let's get away from the Soviets. Let's, let's uh, go surrender to the Americans. They came to the Americans. They built the post-war, the Cold War arsenal of interballistic missiles and so on. And when Ike created NASA, their first chance, they moved over to, from the Army to NASA and went to the Marshall Space Flight Center, named by Ike after one of his close friends and Secretary of State uh, General Marshall. I got a call from them, Walter Wiesman, the youngest of the Germans, asking me if I would like to be a summer faculty consultant at the Marshall Space Flight Center. Were you at Purdue at that time? No, I was at that time at Wayne, still at Wayne, Wayne State, State University. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is 66. So I go uh, in the summer of 67 as a summer faculty consultant. Now they used a lot of these in engineering and physics and so on, but I was the first soft scientist uh, ever invited to serve in that capacity, and Wiesman and uh, and Von Braun were so close that um, I was assigned directly to work for Von Braun, and he uh, wanted me to make a thorough study of the hierarchy of the organization to find out if there were any communication problems, because he too had come to the conclusion that the best way to think about these complex organizations was as communication systems. But he developed his own kind of system in which upward channels, excuse me, upward communication should not be tied to channels. You don't have to go through your boss to get to the top, in other words. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he established this principle of automatic responsibility. The moment that you, Tracy, spot a problem that's within your technical competence, you assume responsibility for it mm -hmm. at that moment and must communicate about it and solve it. If you can't solve it, then we will put additional people on it with you and together collectively, mm -hmm. a working group, teamwork, participation, we will get a recommendation that cannot be overturned by any individual because nobody is smarter than a working group of different technical, technical people. Mm -hmm. um, I found the Monday notes, I found um, uh, many, many communication um, uh, practices that no one had ever dreamed of. And what was so interesting about it was it was in a civil service organization, which by definition, is a bureaucracy, mm -hmm. sort of an iron. Uh, there was a military officer, uh, an Air Force officer, who served in the hierarchy then as a manager. And he said, this could never happen in any of the military. Well, excuse me, but there is now another book called The Team of Teams because 
the Army has found that fighting counterinsurgents in uh, Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, that they've had to go to the team concept and the team uh, overall organization as well. Sorry for the footnote there, mm -hmm. but that book came out after I had finished my book and it is in complete support of it. Even military organizations, it is to their benefit and advantage to open up. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Purdue, the, there, I was very much aware of Purdue connections while I was down there mm -hmm. because I knew of the Purdue astronauts and uh, I knew about Grissom, and I asked Von Braun in particular what, about Grissom, what had happened. And here's where I discovered at first some uh, inter-center rivalry within NASA. Uh, in Houston, most people think that was the big center. Well, that's where the astronauts were, the Johnson Space Center. But the Marshall Space Flight Center is where we did the Saturn V, the rocket that took us to the moon, and so on. And the people at Houston did the, the little piece on top where the astronauts were, and they were having some sort of a test here in the Earth's atmosphere. A fire broke out and killed Grissom and two other astronauts. And we have a building uh, on campus, named after Gus Grissom. Mm -hmm. Von Braun said if um, that had happened in space, well, first of all, we all knew that our standards were much higher. Our communication was to, was to manage risk and complexity, and that other field centers did not have that dedication and competence. Uh, but had that rocket been in space, all Grissom would have had to do would be to open a small window. There would have been no oxygen for by which to kill them. The fire could not have killed them. Close it again and then you're then you're okay. So there was a tragedy there. Mm -hmm. But another Purdue graduate uh, did in fact uh, step on the moon was the first to do it and I was uh, I was with him we all were mm -hmm. there were 7,200 of us at the Marshall Space Flight Center and we had more than 200,000 people in the industry also working on the project mm -hmm. and we had to develop what's called manned flight awareness in which we would send the astronauts around to these contractors and say, oh, by the way, what you're working on will go into the rocket that I will be on. So please, people were, had been unaware of, what the, the, of the importance of their work, and we made them aware. That's interesting because we have in Mr. Armstrong's collection lots of photographs, NASA photos, of them going to visit contractors out yes. in California and Kansas. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, and so. the, typically the, when they would give the speeches to these people, they would say, well, you know, to begin with, I'm going up in a rocket built by the cheapest bidders, uh, so you can imagine how that feels, and got a good, they got a good laugh from that, but there was a very serious uh, point. The Marshall Center, we, hmm. But in addition to this, Von Braun's genius again. Um, point out in the book that at one point when he was still with the army he was called before Congress and asked in a hearing why is it that defense the contractors for your organization in the army perform so much better than it does for the uh, Navy and the Air Force and Von Braun answered it in a word penetration we penetrate the contractor organization. We send our people to their shop floors. They are standing next to the workers and they will tell us things that they will not tell, tell their bosses. Mm -hmm. we, we knew more about what was going on in the defense contractors than their management did. And I tell a story about it, how many cracks there were in the first 
um, uh, second stage of the Saturn V that was delivered to Huntsville. And uh, they denied there were cracks in it. Then they admitted it, but they didn't have the number right, and we did. Hmm. And we took it down to x-ray it, and our number was the correct number. Because NASA had people there. With and we had penetrated the people, and they trusted us and knew that we were trying to manage complexity and risk mm -hmm. and to prevent mm -hmm. the risk, reduce the risk, yeah. That, um, I picked a quote out from your book that I uh -huh. thought was really interesting and kind of relates to that. Would okay. you mind if I read it? No, and ask you to go comment? right ahead. Um, it's in the epilogue. You wrote, the most exciting organizational experience of my life was when we escaped globalization by leaving this planet. It was ever so risky and complicated, but we did it. One of the big surprises to me was the importance of welders to the project. The need for them to reduce risk by finding the proper method of welding exotic metals together for the first time. We did it in short, not so much with a grand theory as with able, pragmatic people taking smart risks with reasoned courage by means of lessons learned through and about open communication and teamwork. Can you comment on that? Yes, yes, yes. Is it the, the fact that the, the skilled craftsmen were so important? Yeah. Is that? Uh, yes, yes. Well, if you think about it, um, all of these different conditions, I, I, I once wa watched the mighty F1 engine being tested in Huntsville, and I thought we were going to be blown away uh, by it. The, the, the heat, the tremendous heat and the pressure and so on, that, that they had to use exotic metals that could withstand heat and um, th these uh, uh, tremendous vibrations and the shock of it all. And uh, so, how do you make them stick together? <laughs> and uh, so, so th it, they did develop a craftsman who could, uh, who could do that and who were vital to the uh, whole mission. And as a matter of fact, it, it worked this way, that um, when Von Braun and his group were in Germany making the B-2, um, they had developed it at Pinemunda on the Baltic, and Heinrich Himmler had given them an order to stay to the last man defending uh, the uh, center from uh, the Soviet Union. But he held a meeting and his top people wanted, mm, we've had enough, we don't want another totalitarian government. So they disobeyed orders and went down to Bavaria to, to, uh, to surrender to the Americans. When the Soviets came, they picked up just a couple of the top administrators, one who had ambitions that rivaled Von Braun's position. He decided to stay because he would. Well, those people went back to the Soviet Union, but they also took the craftsmen as well. And they picked the brain of the top administrators and sent them back to East Germany. But they kept the skilled craftsmen, so far as we know, because of their value. And of course, they beat us into space by using these craftsmen to weld their, their rockets and spaceships, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, so we can't underestimate, we ought not mm -hmm. underestimate the importance of the crafts mm -hmm. that go into the most complicated things on Earth. Right, and it seemed to me you were also saying that every person felt responsibility. That's right. And that's even down that's even right. to the welder or the craftsperson that's at right. that time. We knew. We. I slipped into the we of identification and had met Kenneth Burke here uh, while I was in the first year that I was an assistant professor here at Purdue. And I became devoted to his work. And he taught the new rhetoric as identification and we didn't sometimes need to be persuaded by another source to do it we would do this voluntarily and identify with 
Can you explain that a little bit more? Sure, How yes. Um, I went down thinking I'm going to be working for this technological and scientific organization and it's going to be cold and distant and so on and so forth. And I saw NASA employees at the Marshall Center working 10, 12 hours a week without overtime. While the higher paid, okay. higher paid employees of the contractors would go home at 4.30 or, or, or 5 o'clock. There was this feeling that we were all in this together, mm -hmm. the, a oneness that was so powerful I began a research program on organizational identification. We have ways to measure it. One of my students here at Purdue developed a way to measure it and we know that the higher the degree of identification with an organization, the more successful it's going to be and the better they're going to feel and mm -hmm. like their work. Huh, if this is important. Mm -hmm. We are in this together, mm -hmm. striving to, uh, to achieve this historic goal of putting a human being on the moon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Want me to say more? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just thinking about, um, you know, it has to do with sharing values, that the organization has values, uh -huh. right? That the person yes. has the same, similar values. Yes. Um, and that there's a common goal. Yes. Um, yes. And then I was just wondering, had, did that change somewhat? Like, I, I know you looked at the Challenger disaster at NASA and the Columbia. Yes. Um, you know, what, what were your findings? Um, could you talk a little bit about it? Yes. Um, after we were successful in reaching the moon, uh, the uh, NASA headquarters decided that's enough of the Germans, so let's get rid of them, let's fire them all. And uh, despite their great contribution and the fact that they had become American citizens and so on, they kicked Von Braun upstairs and a very boring, unexciting job. Uh, and NASA went back to the old ways, the old bureaucratic ways, and the communication practices that we had developed that had allowed us to manage the complexity and risk were, um, were, were forgotten. Organizational forgetting. They forgot the practices that did depart from standard organizational practices. I have to admit that, but nonetheless, they were so uh, valuable. Uh, I was preaching to the world, uh, because I was much younger than they as they passed on, and uh, I continued to preach how important these were. And finally, when I did write the book, Apollo Challenger Columbia, uh, the decline of the space program. NASA read it and invited me back a couple of times to international conventions to talk to them because they wanted the young people to know what practice, how we did it, how we did it, because it wasn't part of the organizational, organizational memory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you. I want to ask you a, a few questions about your time at Purdue as a professor. Okay. So, can you talk a little bit about that? You were, did you, you work, uh, did you have an administrative role when you were here? Yes, uh, I was brought back in 1980 by David Berg, uh, who was the head of the Department of Communication then, and I had known him, and after the Esquire article came out, he and was the was an editor, uh, one of the editors of a journal, and asked me to write an essay about that, which I did, and uh, we we knew each other fairly well, and he invited me back, and uh, my wife uh, Elaine, we had met at Kent State, and we had. Um, Kent, the Kent State, Kent State administration knew of my experience with NASA, in fact invited Mr. Wiesman to come up and give a talk after a tragedy happened. 
but I was placed on a commission at Kent State and uh, wrote a book and my co-author was Elaine Anderson who is now Elaine Tompkins mm -hmm. and I'm going to slip this in I'm going to tell it in my speech on Thursday but it's so important I'm supposed to direct my remarks to the graduate students and ways to success when you become a teacher to be flexible demanding but flexible after Four Dead in Ohio, as the song goes. Um, a student in the communication, undergraduate communication theory class came up to me and said, uh, Phil, can I give you a term paper without words? And I said, John, I've never had one. How in the world would you do that? And he said, well, I was on the quad Monday and I had my camera. And I think I can arrange the photographs in a way that tells a story about communication. Hmm. And he gave me the paper, and I gave him an A+. Plus. And he sent the paper to his hometown newspaper. They nominated it, and it won the Pulitzer Prize for photography Fantastic. for 1971. Wow. He allowed us to use the photographs in the book. And for some uh, reason, uh, Tracy, Tracy, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. yes, for some reason, Tracy, and English, British publishers decided to bring that book to republish it this year. Wow. Fantastic. Communication Crisis at Kent State, a case study. Uh, well, um, Elaine came with me. Purdue. She took over COM 114 and I became a professor. And um, um, in 1985, Dean Robert Rengel, the Dean of Hisey, uh, appointed me Associate Dean of the School of Hisey. And I had several jobs. One was to help get people ready for tenure and promotion, which was wonderful. I got to read their work in the anthropology and the language and literature departments and so on. And it was just wonderful. He also uh, gave me the job of writing the kudos for honorary degrees, and I wrote one for Brian Lamb, mm -hmm. who had done well, and the sense has changed the name of the department to the School of Communication. And the other job was to um, change the name of the school, Hissy, because education was leaving to become a separate school, so we needed to change. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to use this um, example this afternoon uh, that uh, I did a survey of the Big Ten and the Ivy League and other universities to see how what they called their undergraduate colleges, and I mentioned this to the department heads in the meeting with the dean, Dean Rangel. And I said, at Yale University, they call it Yale College. That's it, said one of the heads. We'll call us Yale College. And there was great laughter <laughs> and so on. But it went on to, uh, to uh, I recommended that we call it liberal arts, and we did. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was aware of the seven, the trivium and the quadrivium, which make up the original seven liberal arts worthy of a free person. And the trivium was more important. Grammar, logic, rhetoric. More important. But uh, because they were experimenting with democracy. And for people to have democracy, they had to be able to argue with each other, detect specious arguments, refute them, and advance their own arguments and so on. And so my discipline and the trivium uh, do uh, come from that tradition, worthy of free persons. Trivium and the quadrivium. Mm -hmm. I think I may mention too, I, I'm, I've written about James Joyce and I'm hoping, I'm wondering if you have the James Joyce Quarterly in the 
in the library because I've got an article in there about how he used the theory of rhetoric and the enthymeme in, um, in Ulysses. And then in Finnegan's Wake, there are so many layers of puns that someone said to him, Mr. Joyce, some of the puns are trivial. And his reply was, some of them are trivial and some are quadrivial, <laughs> meaning that the full seven liberal arts were, were there. So I am partly responsible for the fact that we changed from Hissy, even though the library still bears yes. the Hissy name, yes. uh, the college is the College of, of Liberal yeah, Arts. Arts. And yeah. I think that's appropriate for, yeah. uh, for Purdue University. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, yes. Um, I have a bit of a long question here. Sure. But this is, um, we're getting close to the time of our tour. Okay. So I have two more questions. Okay. So this is the second to last one. Um, you've written extensively on the successes and failures of organizational communication in the history of the U.S. space program. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pull you back to the space program. Okay, great. Since I'm the flight archivist. Um, the successes of the Apollo era and the failures that led to the Space Shuttle Challenger and Columbia accidents. Today, here at Purdue, there are many students in our aeronautical engineering and our mechanical engineering schools who, are, who dream of and who are working very hard to become part of the teams that will take the first humans to Mars. Based on your experience and your research, what would your advice to them be? Are there one or two lessons that you've learned that are imperative to success in high, complex, risky systems? Yes, yes. And uh, one would be to um, promote um, automatic responsibility and to assert it even if it's not an official practice. Can you explain yes. automatic responsibility? Yes. Uh, von Braun had created it, and I think it went back to the German days, but if you were working on a project, uh, one of these complex, uh, mm, human life is dependent on it, uh, but you were working on it and you perceived a problem that was uh, within your competence, but it had been assigned to the department next door. You assumed responsibility for it the moment you perceived it. Okay. Because they've had opportunities to communicate up the line and sideways what problems they had identified and where they might need help. So you, the minute you, Tracy, perceive it, you own it. Mm -hmm. And it's your responsibility also to communicate this up the line so that if necessary, if you can't solve it alone, resources can be brought to bear on this significant problem that could uh, increase the riskiness mm -hmm. of what, of what we were doing. I would feel free to break the bonds of the rules of formal organizational communication if they didn't allow for open communication and teamwork. If you felt that the uh, integrity of the mission was threatened at all. I have uh, had a signing at uh, Denver at the Tattered Cover Bookstore and four men came up afterwards to have me sign and they bought seven copies of the book. And I said, who, who are you folks? They're all fire chiefs. Mm. There's a chapter about fire in the uh, and they asked, they've pursued me since then. A week ago Monday, I spent the day uh, with the battalion chief meeting top people. They want me to help implement the practices of open communication and teamwork 
that uh, I espouse in the book. They believe they need it. And they face problems that no one realizes. Do you remember the um, Aurora theater shooting? Mm -hmm. Awful. Mm. Nine people killed, 70 wounded. Mm. The police department and the fire department both showed up for this as they should have. And the official report on their behavior found an unwillingness to cooperate. There's a problem that I'm going to be working on when I get back for per perhaps months to come. Mm -hmm. They think ideas for overcoming this can be found in the book. Police departments, on the other hand, if they're called to the same situation in which the firefighters are, let's say there's a let's say there's a shooter in the fire, and so on. They take over as if they were dictators, and they don't have to listen to anyone. They give the orders. Hmm. They don't even need to communicate. It's a terrible problem. And I'm going to be working on it for some time uh, in the future. So I think there are applications in the book uh, for other organizations as well that aren't as dramatic as fire departments and, uh, and uh, police departments. Let's take, let's take um, GM. When I started writing the book, Kelly Kim, do you know Kelly Kim? Mm -hmm. She is a, an, um, a production editor at the Purdue University Press, and she was um, assigned to the book, and every time I would mention the GM ignition problem, the number would increase 12, 2 dozen, so on and so forth, and Kelly finally said, we're going to have to take the number out because it keeps changing all the time. The last time I heard it, it's over a hundred people killed by that. And yet we know there are email messages within the organization about that ignition problem. And now we have the Volkswagen scandal. Think of the risk to people, not just to the global warming, but the people who have respiratory ailments, what these diesel engines are doing to them. This is unforgivable organizational communication practices in ordinary manufacturing. Mm -hmm. My guess is we may have similar problems at Purdue University. We may, uh, not just to single Purdue out, but at all universities. There may be things going on that if we knew about, we could devote attention to and solve and reduce risk for students. Huh? What the book is trying to, to do, Tracy, is to make organization teachers, theory, theorists, and managers all think about workers and the customers and society in general because there is this claim by Ulrich Beck that I cite that we've moved into the risk society, that big business and big science no longer care about this. One week after his book came out, we had Chernobyl, hmm? mm -hmm. some technical difficulties there. But for the space program, I would say that, uh, well, I've given lecture, I gave a lecture at the Embry-Riddle Aeronautical mm -hmm. University in Florida. Every student there wants to be a pilot or an astronaut or what have you, and uh, my lecture to them is printed in the vital speeches of the day. And they, were, we had, they had to bring in extra chairs. They were so excited. And I think that they, and I visited with the class, and I, I, I think they got the word. I hope they remember it mm -hmm. when they become astronauts and engineers in the space program and uh, in aviation, aviation as well. Mm -hmm. Aviation is another area in mm -hmm. which uh, we can, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. 
So it's helping people feel empowered and courageous. Yes. To trust their to yes. trust their education and trust their judgment. Yes. And do the right thing. Yes. Do the right thing. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I wish I'd said it. <laughs> to do simple. the right. Uh, yes. But sometimes yes. that's not easy. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Another thing for the um, university to remember is the finding that you may have noticed in the book too that I didn't expect to find, and that is the importance of analogical thinking. Could you explain that? Yes. The best way to do it, I think, was um, talk about the B-17 and how it was not going to be built because it was too complicated for a pilot to fly in 1935 until the pilots came up with a checklist that would require teamwork on their part. Right. Atul Gawanda, professor of surgery and a practicing surgeon at Harvard University, discovered the checklist, applied it uh, with the World Health Organization to a worldwide experiment that after introducing the checklist and the teamwork that goes with it, a mere nurse can question the surgeon. Oh, you forgot the antibiotics before the incision and so on and so forth. The fatalities dropped significantly all over the world. United States, Canada, Africa, India, and so on dropped. This analogical thinking, which means we can't just think of one kind of organization because we may find the solution in another kind of, of, uh, of organization. Don't uh, drop your tools was a lesson learned from the Man Gulch fire in which all those young hotshots were killed. They raced up the hill trying to outrun a fire carrying their Pulaski's and with their backpacks because it was part of their identity. Right. And Dr. Berwick has found learn when to drop your tools when they're outmoded and useless and develop new, new tools. This analogical thinking, the universities need to help people see that and find that. There may be well solutions in uh, NASA and uh, these uh, highly technical organizations that may find solutions in other kinds of uh, industries. And I will have to think about that. My own understanding of the history of NASA and the Germans and so on. See if I can find an example of something they borrowed from somewhere somewhere else and but we do know that they brought practices from Germany to the United States and used them in the army and in NASA that were not part of the traditional uh, curriculum and uh, rules and regulations of those organizations they were accepted at the time to yes. get the job done. Yes. In a, the, in a that's hurry. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Within the decade. Yeah. As, right. uh, yes. Right. Yeah. After Von Braun invited me, I told him the ten problems I had discovered. He invited me back to top the to top staff and board meeting, and. Um, um, I've forgotten where I was going with it. What what had we been talking about? Uh, well, it was the most frightening. It was the most frightening speech situation I've ever had. I was speaking to the, the audience of fifty to sixty of the top rocket scientists in the world, and I was going to tell them the list of ten problems that they had and had to solve, and so mm -hmm. on. And that was it. But I'm. But th there's an openness there, isn't there, Tracy, when you think about it. Yeah, I'm a 33-year-old PhD from Purdue University. I'm allowed to run loose in the organization, systematically or interviewing all the main players and uh, to find out what problems are there. And Von Braun sent them a letter saying, tell this man the truth. He will protect, protect your identity, but for God's sakes, tell him the truth so we know the problems. Right. Isn't there an honesty there, an integrity 
to the mission and to the health and well-being of the astronauts. Don't right. you think? Yeah, that's the ultimate. I that's the ultimate, yes, yes. Open it up. Let him in to see what the problems are. A lot of managers don't want problems mm, to be known. And, uh, yeah, well, that shouldn't be happen in, in a world of increasing complexity and risk. Do you agree with me? I agree. That the world is getting more complex yeah. and riskier all the time? Cars mm -hmm. without drivers? Hmm. How will they do on the snow and ice in Denver? <laughs> Someone wrote to the le a letter to the editor of the Denver Post the day I left, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, this has been really fascinating. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you so for much, Tracy. Talking with me. And, <coughs> um, I'm sorry, we have to run to a, to a tour now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but thank you. I'm going to need some water. I have okay. been fighting it.